to address us on the topic of religion, violence, and the modern world, we are honored to have with us today Imam Hamza Yusuf from the United States of America. Imam Hamza Yusuf, as they say in Arabic, is Ghaniyun Anit Ta'arif. He's in no need of any introduction. He's the director of Zaytuna Institute and a well-known personality in the Western Muslim community as well as the Muslim world. We are grateful for him for accepting our invitation despite his busy schedule. And I believe this is his last public event in the UK. Um, as most of you are well aware, Imam Hamza has been on a tour of the United Kingdom. I'd like now Imam Hamza Yusuf to come to the podium and deliver his talk. Imam Hamza Yusuf. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala sayyidina wa habibina afdari khalqillah Muhammad ibn abdillah wa ala alihi wa sahabatihi wa man wala wa la hawla wa la quwata inna billah wa la hawla wa la quwata inna billah wa la hawla wa la quwata inna billah Alhamdulillah First of all, I appreciate the invitation. Unfortunately, because this talk is the last of the talks, uh, you're looking at a reasonably spent force. I've been here for two weeks, and so I've been a little exhausted the last few days. And I'm hoping that I can possibly keep my thoughts together enough to get through this. I thought it was interesting that on the door over there they have three scimitars that are really symbolic of Islam traditionally in the West and they're turned upside down which was a common symbol in the West to turn the Muslim sword upside down. I don't know why there's three. I'm curious as to the symbolism of that and who put it up there and what they were thinking. But there's also another interesting piece of symbolism there, which is a painting that has history in the back, and then there's several historical images there. And one of the things about a civilized society is that they always place a very important emphasis on history. Because if you don't place an important emphasis on history, you will lose the opportunity of gaining so much of the wisdom and benefit that exists in the study of history. If you look at the Qur'an, the Qur'an is actually one-third a type of history. It's sacred history. It's not a history that is verifiable with footnotes or sources. And that could be said as well about the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is very difficult to prove historically. In fact, most of the material in the Old Testament is ahistorical, although it's dealing with very historical issues. So the Old Testament is a history book. And one could argue also that the New Testament is a history book, although it's a sacred history book. And many historians, modern historians completely reject it. And there are historians that actually don't believe there was ever a person named Abraham, that it's a mythological figure like Osiris or Vishnu. And particularly you'll find this in continental history. Germany has a tradition of over 100 years of basically denying the existence of historical figures, sacred historical figures that Muslims, Christians, and Jews all believe are actual human beings that did live. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, أَفَلَمْ يُسِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ haven't they traveled in the earth? And in other verses, سِيرُ فِي الْأَرْضِ فَانْذُرُوا كَيْفَ كَانَ عَاقِبَةُ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْرِكُمْ Travel in the earth and look at those who went before you. That's essentially a command, and it's in the imperative, سِيرُ It's a command, although the, the command in the Qur'an can be used for obligations as well as recommendations. But it is a command in the Arabic to study history. 
to actually look at the peoples that went before you and think about what brought them to destruction. Why were they destroyed? Now, what's very interesting is Arnold Toynbee studied 21 civilizations. And Arnold Toynbee actually credits Ibn Khaldun as being one of his major influences because Ibn Khaldun was somebody who studied dynasties and attempted to understand why they came to destruction, why they actually ended the way that they did. And that is the Quranic imperative, to actually look and see why they came to an end. How was their aqibah? And why did they get there? Now, Arnold Toynbee studied 21 civilizations, and he found that they followed certain patterns. And he actually identified four stages. What's interesting is one of the stages was a militaristic stage. It was a stage in which the society became basically an economy and a civilization that was based on military might and power. And that was often followed by this period of conquest and then luxury. But he pointed out that the great flaw of every civilization that attained immense power was they overextended their power. They went beyond their limits, transgressed their limits. And in the light of the Umayyad dynasty, which begins approximately in 661, and ends in 750. It was a very short-lived dynasty. And it's different from, say, the Abbasid dynasty, which goes from about 750 to 1258. Although the latter period, it's arguable whether or not you could really call it the Abbasid dynasty because it was so convoluted with other elements, ruling elements. And the caliphs were, in essence, much like the latter-day Roman emperors that had almost no power whatsoever. But if you look at the destruction of the Umayyads, according to Dr. Khaled Blankenship in his book, The Jihad State, he argues that in fact it was an overextended military operation that ended in failure. They could no longer sustain the expansion that was so immense at that initial phase. Now, a lot of Muslims actually pride themselves on that initial expansion. But if you look historically at that expansion, and I mean certainly it's arguable, from a secular point of view they would reject a spiritual dimension and simply interpret it in materialistic avenues. I mean there's no doubt that there was some driving force that can't simply be reduced to materialism. It's arguable whether that or not that was actually a positive force on the world because if you look at the Umayyads, I mean, one of the things that they were totally uninterested in is spreading Islam. I mean, the Umayyad dynasty had no interest in converting other peoples to Islam. And during the period of the Umayyad dynasty, only about less than 15% of conquered peoples ever actually uh, became Muslim. That is very different from the Abbasids, who were very interested in spreading Islam. And during their period, over 50% of their conquered peoples actually became Muslims. So it was a very different experience. Now the Umayyads also demanded that if you did become Muslim, like a Jewish person, you not only had to convert to the religion, but you actually had to convert to an Arab tribe. So you not only joined a religion, but you actually joined a tribe. And a lot of Muslims aren't really aware of that little historical fact. So the Muwali system developed where if I wanted to become a Muslim, I became a Mawla which is really a derogatory term, although it does have its opposite meaning because it's from a linguistic branch of words known as the al which are words that mean one thing and its opposite. So mola is a servant, but it's also a, a master. It also means somebody who's in protection, and that was obviously the meaning of the people that were converting. They were the mawali. But it was still seen as a derogatory term. And the proof of that is that Imam Madik, radiallahu anhu, considered it an egregious insult that he was called a mawla of the Yemeni tribe that he was from, as opposed to being actually from that lineage. So it was seen, without any doubt, as a second-class status amongst the early Arabs. 
Now, this military expansion of the Omeyyads was, according to them, fulfilling this command to go out and subdue the world and to subdue it to the power of Islam, the might of Islam. And they believed that they were promised dominion and success over all the peoples of the earth. And that was very much, I think, part of their doctrine. Well, that was not adopted by the Abbasids. And I think it's very important for Muslims to consider the fact that those civilizations that took this version of Islam as their version of Islam had very short-lived societies. Very short-lived societies. They basically came to end within a hundred years, which is what Ibn Khaldun says is the average period of the, the strength of a civilization. The Abbasids, on the other hand, did not. Well, they introduced several things that were not there before, like the concept of Dar al that it's actually wise to have good diplomatic relations with peoples. Now, there are Muslim scholars that actually believe that that's only a strategy, a short-term strategy. And you shouldn't extend that like the Qur'an gives 10 years. You shouldn't extend it beyond 10 years and then a new treaty is made. So there are a lot of fuqaha, and you will find this in the books, that actually say this is all strategies, that what the Muslims really want is global domination. This is what they want. They want global domination. And this is what a lot of the people that are attacking Islam today are attacking it based on this version of Islam, which is a version. I mean, I cannot deny that because I've, I've read enough in the books to see that that version does exist. However, there are alternative versions of Islam. In other words, there are medhebs. There are ways of interpreting things. And those other versions and understandings are actually authoritative. They have their scholars, they have their promoters. I mean, it's interesting that Ibn Taymiyyah himself was of the belief that all jihad was defensive. You see, there are many scholars who say, no, jihad has an offensive element. And it's absolutely acceptable for Muslims to go out on an offensive jihad and an obligation to go out twice a year, for instance, to conquer new lands, conquer new peoples. This is one version. Ibn Taymiyyah said that every single example of the Prophet Sallallahu campaigns, including the campaign to Tabuk, which if you read in Sahih al-Bukhari, it's pointed out that they were actually given information that it was the Byzantines that were amassing forces to attack the Muslims. And that is when the army was sent out. And when they actually got there, there was no battle. The issue was resolved and the Prophet Sallallahu returned. So this is one View. Now, if you look at the three Imams, Abu Hanifa, Imam Madik, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, all three of them believe that the purpose of jihad is what is known as izarat al-adawa, to remove adawa, to remove belligerence, to remove some threat that is looming out there and is in some way going to harm the Muslims, either their peoples or the subject peoples of the Muslims, who traditionally were known as the Dhimmiyun, that that was the purpose to go out. That is not the belief of Imam Shafi'i radiallahu But it's very interesting that of the four Imams, although there are two different opinions, the ruling madhabs in the history of Islam have been Hanafi and Maliki. These are the two madhabs that God has given sovereignty to in the earth. And in particular, the Hanafi Madhab, which has probably the most lenient views of non-Muslim peoples out of the, the four Imams, which is why the American RAND report, which is advising the US government in how they should deal with the Islamic threat, is suggesting that the United States promote the Hanafi Madhab. So that's the official Madhab of the State Department. So if you see any of the president praying with his hands under his navel, you'll understand why. So that is the idea, right? Is that this school of thought 
It's part of our tradition. And one of the things that really strikes me about Islam is that we always talk about Al-Islam صَارِحٌ لِكُلِّ زَمَانٍ وَمَكَانٍ I mean, how many times have you heard that slogan? Al-Islam صَارِحٌ لِكُلِّ زَمَانٍ وَمَكَانٍ Islam is possible in every time and place. Well, what does that mean? You see, the way most Muslims interpret it is that you have to rearrange the time and the place and make it in accord with a 7th century model. I mean, this is the idea that most Muslims have. I don't believe that. I actually believe that that means that Islam gives you the tools to actually be a Muslim in any time and any place, including living in non-Muslim lands. And that we have within our usul tradition, which is the juristic methodology of deriving rules and rulings, we have within that tradition all that we need Wherever we are, whether it's Great Britain or the United States or Canada or any other place on the planet, tools that we've been given by our tradition, which includes revelation and it also includes intellect. Because Fakhruddin al Razi says, Nurun ala nur means wahyun ala aqal. You can have revelation, but if you've got idiots, that are interpreting that revelation, you have a very serious problem. And our history is filled with ignorant people attempting to interpret the Qur'an and the Sunnah and ending up leading themselves astray and leading other people astray. And one of the things that the Prophet ﷺ says about the end of time is that ignorant people will be taken as leaders. They will be asked questions of fiqh. And they will give their responses and their responses are based on ignorance and they end up going astray and leading others astray. That, that's a sign of the latter days in Sahih al-Bukhari. And that is because there are no longer ulama. There are no longer people that actually have this in-depth knowledge of the tradition, that are able to access the tradition. And this is one of the major problems confronting the Muslims today. And this is why one of the responses that is so common in the Muslim world today is reaction. There's no strategic planning. There's no actually thought about what does it mean if I do this, this, or this, you see. And we've got a bunch of idiots running out there and causing an immense amount of damage to Islam and to the Muslims. And another reason for that is because we've got all of these people out there that aren't really Muslims, but they're rather in a spiritual sense of the word. Because the Quran says, وَمَنْ أَسْلَمَ فَأُولَٰئِكَ تَحَرَّوا رَشَدَ Those who enter into a state of submission are fervently seeking guidance. You see, Islam is an active state. It's not a passive state. You're not born a Muslim. That is a lie. You know, this idea that everybody's born a Muslim and you revert to Islam. There's no reversion to Islam. You convert to Islam. It's an active event. I mean, there's a spiritual reality of you're a Muslim at birth, just like every creature is in a state of Islam. Everything in the heavens of the earth is in Islam. From that point of view, if you direct that verse, because that Allah uses a generalized substantive, if you look at that, then everybody's a Muslim. Well, that's not true. So how do you differentiate? There's an active Islam and there's a passive Islam. Every human being on this planet is in passive Islam. They're all in passive Islam. So the Muslim world that prides itself on being Muslim, they're as Muslim in many ways as the rest of the planet. Because they haven't actively entered into Islam. They haven't actively submitted to the will of God. They've simply taken a sociological identification. And this is tribal Islam, Banu Islam. And they begin to use this tribal identification vis-a-vis -vis other tribes out there, Banu Yahud, and Banu Nasara, and Banu Ilhad, and Banu Humanism, Banu Sin, the tribe of China, whatever. And so this is how they look at it. So these people aren't looking at Britain or America as potential co-religionists. Because that's simply not possible. They're kuffar. And kuffar aren't Muslims. We're Muslims. They never thought how they became Muslim. They never actually thought that one day that their 
ancestors were actually Hindus because every Indian Muslim believes that they're originally Arabs. See, we're not Shudras or Harijans. I'm a Qureshi. I'm a Siddiqi. I'm a this or I'm a that. That's it, right? I, don't, I can't admit that, that I was once actually the lowest man on the Hindu totem pole and escaped that fate by saying Shahada. Even though we know historically that we had massive conversion in India from the lowest caste. Why? Because Islam has always offered upward mobility. I mean, the Europeans, before they had America to go and get upward mobility in, because you were born in, in Britain as a bricklayer, you, into a bricklayer's family, you died a bricklayer. And that's the way it was. You didn't go to, to Oxford if your grandfather and father was a bricklayer. You just learned how to lay bricks. When they went to America, they migrated to America, they said, well, let's get rid of all that nonsense. Before they used to do that, they used to go to the Muslim world. They were called renegados. See, before they went to America, they actually used to go to the Muslim world and they would become Muslim. And so you have people like Denz Dezen, who was a, a man from Holland who became the head of the Moroccan Navy. You have Ahmed al Inglisi, who becomes the ruler of the Burigrig Dawla in Salah, and he's actually from England. You have Peter Lyle, who was a Scottish admiral in the Ottoman Navy, who took the name Murat Ra'is and actually fought the Americans in the War of Tripoli. And that's where, that's where Europeans went. They actually went and became Muslim and moved up very quickly in the ranks. Many of them were very clever, especially in the military. That was an area of upward mobility for Europeans in the Muslim world. We know some of the greatest Ottoman military people were actually converted Christians. And the Yenisheri, which were the crack troops, the special forces of the Ottomans, were almost entirely taken from Christian Europe. And Christians used to actually give their sons, because the Yenisheri were so well treated, made an immense amount of money in their military careers, and often retired as wealthy business people. So this was the Muslim world vis-a-vis -vis Europe. So that type of Islam, Beni Islam, the tribal Islam, has become so prevalent. And so the reaction now is the reaction of tribal members. And this is the Jahiliyyah. See, anything that happens to us, we become Jahili people. Hamiyat al Jahiliyyah. And so if co-religionists are attacked in Iraq, anybody who's a member of the tribe of Beni Amrikan, is suddenly halal, you see, because all I want is vengeance. I'm not even thinking that they might be Muslim or they might be a potential Muslim because you have to be an active kafir. Kafir is active. It's not a passive quality. The ulama have never seen kufr as a passive quality. You have to actively be a kafir. You cannot be passively in a state of kufr. You can be passively in a state of ghafla, and that's why most of these people here aren't even categorized as kafirun in any real sense other than a legal sense that relates to burial and inheritance rights and things like that. They're actually ghafilun. And some of them aren't really even ghafilun because they're actually actively trying to find the guidance of God in their own way of understanding it. You see, I became Muslim from a Christian background, and I don't believe I was ever a kafir. Because I never rejected anything I thought was true. And when Islam was presented to me, I, it seemed to me to be true. And so I accepted it. So what was I before I was a Muslim? See, there's a lot of youngsters out there in England that say, Kafir, he's a Kafir. Halal al dam That's their attitude because they're Beni Islam. They're just tribal members. And they don't see Islam as the truth that it is, not only universal, but actually appealing to large numbers of people in human history. Taking one-fifth of the world's population. And there was a time when they took it through active conversion. All of this reaction that we're seeing out there in the Muslim world, which is almost entirely without any strategic thought, in every textbook on war, it's invariably called a, a book of strategy. 
Because that's what war is. It's actually strategy. It's strategic planning. So even if they were really mujahidun, if they were really, they would have a strategy. You see an overarching strategy. But there's not. There's just reaction, events. Some spectacular, some not. But that's what's out there, you see. Because you don't have people with intellect thinking about things. Now there are times in, in Muslim history when the Muslims made truces. There's times when the Muslims made truces with the Crusaders. And they actually honored the truces. This is during occupation of Palestine. In the 11th century. In the 12th century. Yes, Muslims. Salahuddin al Ayyubi. This great hero that everybody raises up. He actually made truces. He was very honorable. In fact, he was so honorable that he became a, a basic, a folk hero in European civilization. Because of his honor. But he actually made strategic truces. You see, so this idea that you know, jihad until the end will never, you can't make truces with the, this, that, or the other. Because there's no strategic thought there. There's just reaction. There's hamiya. And Allah describes that as a jihad equality. Zealotry. Hamiya. In fact, if you look at the root word according to Ibn Ujinni, which is Hamim, Hamasa, which we get Hamas, is a type of zealotry. Hamia, which is to defend or protect, is a type of zealotry. You see, Hamia, Himaya, to defend or protect. But then you move into the third category, which is Hamaka, which is stupidity. You see, zealotry leads to stupid actions. When people are zealots, they can't think. In fact, Sun Tzu says in The Art of War, anger your enemies and send them into disarray. And that's military strategic thinking. Anger your enemies and send them into disarray. So that's actually a strategy in war. To make your enemies so angry they can't think. Because ghadab, I mean the Prophet ﷺ said, don't get angry. It's not that anger is not a human quality, it is. In fact, the ulama say that ghadab, when he said don't get angry, what he was actually saying was, don't let your anger overcome you. So that you can't think. Because people that are angry, that's why a judge, a qadi, cannot, لا يقضي وهو غضبان. A qadi cannot judge in a case when he's angry. That's a principle in Islamic ruling. So this is one of the major problems that we have, is we have anger, we have rage, which is a deadly sin that takes over people. Now, that's about Muslims. Now let me talk a little bit about these people over here. 